All right. Um, so I, so the other women in this article, I just asked three basic questions. Um, the first of which was what inspired you to a career in aviation and join the military? Um, seeing it, first of all, uh, there were Air Force jets from Holloman Air Force Base that were doing fighter lead in training and our branch had the biggest barn at the end of uh, civilization, you know, we were at the end of the road and there was nothing but BLM land after that. So they kind of anchored their dogfighting practice over our hay barn. So seeing it was the first thing, that was the seed, excuse me. And then reading about it, um, we, we didn't have a telephone or a television, so books were a, um, a big deal at our house. And I read a book called Jungle Pilot and it, about a, um, a World War II veteran who had tried to get into aviation through the military and, and his journey. And um, so that was, the seed was seeing it. I would say the water was reading about it and getting to finally along the way meet uh, a pilot or two. And then really the ground that that was all planted in and watered was the foundation of home. and. Uh, I think because I couldn't afford the books, let alone the lessons, the military not only was what I had seen and, and really was my idea of what flying was, but it was the only way I was gonna get into a cockpit. So having um, the foundation of a love of family produced a love of country. So getting to fly in the Navy was just um, a dream come true. That is awesome. And you faced a lot of obstacles um, as one of the first women to fly the F-18. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the top obstacles that you faced as a female in aviation? And what were some ways that you overcame that? You know, from, you know, maybe right. some sexism to also just the logistics of things. Right. Um, any, I think no matter who we are, no matter what we choose to do, there's going to be some fences to cross over. And so I would say in an overarching uh, reply to that, and then we'll get into some specifics, but first of all, don't let an offense get in the way of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be for anyone doing anything. Um, and then, you know, to a specific of surviving sometimes when uh, I wasn't, uh, wasn't welcome. Uh, it, you know, broadening out your peer group is something that we should do our whole life. As kids in grade school, all the way through to, um, you know, grandparents. And that is don't, don't make your only friends your squadron friends. Get out in the community, whether it's church, community service, teaching swim lessons, uh, joining a volleyball team. There's just ways. One of the girls that I flew with, she always signed up for the local drama club and, and was a part of the community theater. You know, broadening your peer group, it gives you a great sense of peer pressure and it's balanced. So I would say that is a survival technique in life for anyone. Uh, now, I, I will say it's kind of interesting that some of the things that um, were put in, in my path that I had to figure out, was that no, was it an answer or was it an opinion? Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to accept no when the answer is no. That doesn't mean that's the end of you know, all our efforts. Uh, we just have to change tact. We have to change directions. And then sometimes it's an opinion uh, spoken with conviction, but it's really not the answer. And so initially I faced a lot of no's starting with career day in high school where the, the uh, pilot in charge asked me if I was lost and then told me this is career day, not hobby day. You need to go find something girls can do. And um, looking back now, I, I find it amusing that women had been allowed into military flying three years prior to me going 
to that career day. And I'm sure that it wasn't something that just happened quietly in the corner and nobody knew about it. Um, it was probably just like when women were the, um, the combat exclusion policy was lifted. It sent ripples across all of Christendom and more. You know, it wasn't something that came quietly. And so I'm not sure what his motivation for, you know, blocking my, my uh, path there, but I went ahead and sat down uh, quickly in the closest seat and thought, I, I signed up for only one thing today, aviation. We're not at our school. We bust into the big sophisticated town of Alamogordo to go to the career day and the buses were locked. So I got to sit and listen to it anyway. And firm answer, but just continuing uh, to look and search and find a different recruiter. And, uh, but one of the things I would really admonish anyone is don't stand still while you're trying to make your way into an occupation, a profession, whatever it is, because as one of, one of uh, the gentlemen that I trained with, uh, Admiral Met Maslowski, he was going to become the CAG on, and he was in my F-18 class learning, going through all the different aircraft that were going to be on his carrier. And one of his sayings that I love is, I don't mind giving rudder commands, but I really don't want to give propulsion commands. So get moving, just get started. You'd be surprised how many different things you learn along the way that can apply. And then the people you meet along the way. So you become, a, I think, a better rounded person and you put yourself in the path of, of finding more opportunities when you get going. It may not be the perfect job. It may not be the perfect occasion. But um, one of the, one of the big, big lessons learned that I can think of in the Navy was um, I had become a surgrad in T2s. So I finished my three aircraft leading up to getting my wings and then my old skipper in T2s who was a great skipper we still keep in touch commander Fred Grant and um, he really went to bat to be able to have me I didn't know that until just a couple of months ago and he wrote me the behind the scenes of the commodore of the base uh, using some rather colorful language saying we will not have a blankety blank female instructor on this base and um, Commander Grant went ahead and chose me to come back and be a surgrad, much to, I'm sure, the uh, detriment of his fitness report <laughs> written by that same Commodore. But he just saw, thought fair is fair. Well, halfway through my tour, he had a change of command. The new commander came on board, and he was not happy about uh, inheriting a female instructor. And so he very publicly uh, shamed me and took uh, my my proposed call and guns, which is what everybody dreamed of teaching, um, and said, "No, I'm, you're going to go teach out of control flight." And it was something that nobody wanted to fly, even their one assigned, let alone teach it every day. You know, going up, departing the aircraft multiple times, and recovering it if the student can't, and trying to make sure the student will be safe on their solo flight and can recover from stall spin, any kind of unusual attitude you can imagine. And you know, I would normally get familiar with what they would had for breakfast before we finished the flight. And, and then every night I'd kind of get my own equilibrium grounded again, because when you do negative, positive, lateral G over and over again, um, you know, it, it kind of messes with your, your ears a bit. So, doing that for a year as a punishment. And I just decided, you know what, he may mean it as a punishment, but I'm just going to do what God put before me to do to the best of my ability. And dug in and um, it never got any more fun, but I just thought, uh, I will not be scared away from this. I will not be uh, feelings hurt out of this uh, that I've worked so hard for. And you know, that is probably some of the best training that I ever had. 
was being the instructor in a field I did not want. And um, so that's, that's one of the lessons that I've looked back to see where, you know, do not let an offense get in the way of an opportunity. That is great advice for, you know, this industry and beyond just for life. That's great advice. Um, so what advice would you give to, you know, girls, to our daughters who are want, looking towards a career in aviation? Occurred. Aviation was in a pilot crisis. There were pilots needed and, and none on the way. And of course, that has shut down so much that now they're is not a lot of openings in commercial aviation. But I would encourage you to go for it anyway. For one thing, there's more openings in cargo flying now. And the military flights and mission aviation flights and bush pilots that are used in areas where there's not a lot of roads or, or it's, avail it's accessible by boat, those things haven't changed. Um, Anchorage, Alaska was the busiest airport in the world uh, this spring, just because of so much coming in. Cargo and planes are the way that people get around up there. Mm -hmm. So if you have a draw towards aviation and you find that you have the skill set, maybe not the tools yet, but you have the skill set, then I would really recommend it. One of the things that I love absolutely love about aviation is it's so objective gravity is gravity no matter who you are and you learn to deal with gravity using Bernoulli's principle of dynamic and fluids and you know lift is lift and so you don't have to have a, a in, incredible networking or uh, any kind of a name in the community just uh, study hard and, and get started. And everything you do as a kid, excuse me, everything you do as a kid growing up, it really does hone your skills towards piloting, whether it's playing outside, problem solving, uh, sports, drama, music, cheerleading. I mean, truly anything you're doing, as long as you're out there and active and uh, one of the things, one of the best things I think you could do as a young person is get a job. Jobs require us to be on time. They require us to perform under a certain amount of pressure and they make us consequences. And um, it's just such a great training field for aviation. And I would say 35 years later, I still love it every time I pre-flight, I get as excited as when I would go catch my horse to saddle it. I mean, it's just a great, a great profession, a great love. That's amazing. So what would you tell um, women in military aviation today? What advice would you give them? You know, I... I think they're still crossing frontiers uh, in aviation. And so keep in mind that even though women have been allowed into aviation since I think 1974, and then they came in 75, I think, area. Anyway, you know, if you follow that tendril back, it's been, a, it's been quite some time that women have been allowed in, but there haven't been that many women that have been drawn to military aviation. So you're still, I know, very outnumbered. And one of the things that I always found is don't check in your girl card. There, you won't have a lot of, um, now you might get a lot of laughs in the ready room uh, if you try to act like one of the guys, but behind your back, they, they still expect, uh, But because many uh, 
um, example you said. All right, I think I lost you for a minute. It cut me out and it got me back in. <laughs> it was quick. <laughs> um, and it looks like it's still recording too. Um, that's awesome. And so, um, so just to kind of recap, you know, um, I think it cut out where you said, don't cash in your girl card. Can you, can you elaborate on that one more time? Sure. Um, don't cash in your girl card. And um, being one of the guys is, is one of the things that um, certainly we can enjoy the camaraderie of a squadron, but um, you won't earn respect by trying to become a guy. Um, the differences between men and women are, are complementary. Uh, studies have shown that when you have a male group and a certain group IQ or a female group, and a certain group IQ. When you mix men and women, the group IQ is bumped up. And not because one group is smarter than the other group. It's because that mix of bringing a different perspective, different ideas in different uh, directions, that's what uh, bumps up our group IQ. And so military aviation is a great place for women to bring what women bring to the game. And um, so I, I would encourage you just uh, remember, you know, camaraderie around aviation is great, but don't check in your girl card. I love that. I haven't heard of it phrased that way, but that is a good way to explain it. <laughs> I think it's my phrase. <laughs> Um, and I read that this month, I don't know if has it happened or not, that you're taking your last flight with Southwest. Oh, it's this Thursday. Yes. This Thursday. So two days. Yes. Um, I'm on the countdown. Yeah. Um, how, what are your emotions surrounding um, the end of this chapter closing for that? Oh, I am super excited. I, I just, um, to be honest, I had looked at what was on my on my schedule and on my plate and things that I wanted to do but didn't have the time to do. And I was really wondering how I was going to make it all fit. And then this opportunity came. And so I just, I'm certainly thrilled to have had my time at Southwest and uh, love flying Boeing aircraft and love flying as a team, the Southwest uh, flight attendant, pilot, ops agent, and all the below the wing team. We just have a great, a great camaraderie there at Southwest. There's no us them lines that that are are put down. Uh, some people may, you know, people are all different, and some try to draw them, but it just doesn't stick. Everybody tends to enjoy everybody, and so I love that, and I certainly plan to stay in touch. Uh, my husband is continuing to be a captain at Southwest Airlines. But in the future, one of the things that I'm very excited about is working with a couple of museums that I joined uh, the board of a couple of years ago, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, and specifically their education program, and then the um, Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, and specifically their Academy for Flight, which is an incredible um, STEM program that if you have kids, look into that. I know they're shut down for a little while because of all the masks and muzzles that are out, but, but uh, really exciting work with kids there. And then Angel Flight. My husband and I both joined the board of South Central Angel Flight just recently and got uh, qualified and have been doing some angel flight missions. And so I'll continue flying our Piper Malibu and, you know, taking people to their medical appointments or taking them home and doing different things like that. Uh, I've got some things that I do here in my hometown that I enjoy working with a, a school, a charter school to an orphanage. And so I have a lot to uh, enjoy other than uh, flying Boeings. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you have um, a lot going on to still keep you busy and still keep um, aviation in your heart. 
Right, and I have the opportunity to speak at a few uh, different different places, so uh, it's it's good. New chapter, but a good one. That's good. Well, we are so excited for you. Um, and that was that was the end of my questions. Unless there's something else that you wanted okay. to add, or something else you wanted to say. Well, your questions were were very good, and I think um, I think right now is a time, and I'll speak specifically to the young ladies and young men that are looking at aviation. And I know the military doesn't have an unlimited amount of, of pilot seats, and they're very specific who they give them to. So, uh, you know, that is a hard, it's a hard place to get in, but it is an amazing, uh, amazing training, amazing, um, path to follow. One of the things that I've learned recently is just all the different, um, the different military cockpits to get into. Sometimes it's not active duty. Maybe it's finding a reserve unit near you and, and getting hired by that reserve unit and then heading to flight school. And of course, National Guard. Um, if, if you're where there is a civil air patrol, I know that's an opportunity sometimes to get a few flights. The 99s, Women in Aviation, uh, EAA, there's lots of places that you can go to just get, kind of get a taste for it and see, is this something I would enjoy? I know there's places you can get your, um, your ground school for free. And uh, on captainschultz.com, I have a drop down spot that tells of a few of those places, and I hope to add to it more where there's scholarships available. And so, um, if you're interested in it, even if you just get a, a job pumping gas at the airport, you know, or cleaning, cleaning. Uh, I, I guess my kids will only stay quiet for so long. <laughs> oh, well, bring them out. Let me meet them. Hey, Colton, come here. Come here. She wants to meet you. Come here, buddy. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess I do have one last question, and this is more um, personally driven than, you know, what would you say for someone whose career in military aviation is coming to a close and they're looking to enter, you know, the civilian side of aviation, what advice would you give them in this right. unstable climate? You know, uh, I would say, first of all, get into a cockpit so that you keep some currency. And that may be as simple as maybe finding out if there's any angel flights going out, coming back, and just ride along, be an assistant on an angel flight. You need no qualifications. And uh, probably the person flying will even let you log the time, uh, you know, because they probably don't need the time. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you, there's just different, different possibilities of keeping in a cockpit, keeping that scan going and also your logbook current. But uh, the, um, cargo side of the house is certainly expanding. Talking to Amazon and FedEx and those different groups, um, it's like Christmas every day since COVID has hit. There's, they are so busy. Their, their world has expanded while commercial aviation has temporarily shrank. And then there's some great opportunities in Mission Aviation Fellowship uh, out of Idaho. There, um, I think it's Napa, Idaho. But just uh, don't be don't be discouraged by the pandemic. It has shifted things, but it hasn't ended the need for pilots. Mm.